Hello, I'm Scruffy, and today I'd like to give some attention to a little game that isn't a first party title or a household name, but is still packed with charm and a captivating soundscape. It's called Pan Pan, created by Spellcraft and published by Might and Delight. And it's an open plane adventure game that approaches everything using its colorful, minimalist environment. The story is told by exploring the environment, puzzles are built into the environment, and there isn't text to guide you or give you feedback. Instead, there are symbols in the environment to help make connections and cutscenes to help highlight your progress. So you're left to figure out not only the solution to your problem, the main character needing to repair their crashed spaceship, but also interpret what tasks need to be done in the first place. To that end, the sound design and especially the music are tied to the environment in a very elegant way. I reached out to the composer and sound designer for the game, Simon Vicklin, about his experience creating this unique soundscape, and he graciously got back to me with a detailed account from which I will quote in this video. He also had Might and Delight release the soundtrack to the game on YouTube. The link to that, as well as a link to Simon's own website, are in this video's description. So props to him in advance for immensely helping this video along. And don't worry, this video won't give away late game spoilers or any solutions to the game's puzzles. Now, I think the first thing you'd notice about Pan Pan is the charming sci-fi visual style made of simple, bold geometry and flat colors. And the first thing you'd hear about Pan Pan is a shimmery, amorphous soundtrack that drones and echoes in the background, and sound effects that match the cute visual style but also sound unfamiliar, not exactly recordings. Character voices also have a natural cadence to them, but don't sound like human voices. Well, none of it is recorded. Simon created all the soundscape and soundtrack of this game using synthesizers, which worked with the sci-fi space exploration theme, and which used simple, clean sounds for the minimalist visuals. It all gels together as soon as you start picking up the controls and the protagonist's main goal. Once you realize that goal is to locate missing ship parts to repair your ship, you can see where I got hooked on this game, you have to explore various branching locations in the open plane ahead, and figure out what can be done first and what's locked behind abilities you haven't learned or environmental changes you haven't made yet. And since you have to read this entirely through environmental clues, you're going to spend some time idling in one area or another, thinking about the solution to a problem. So firstly, Simon needed to create music that didn't intrude on that thinking. Something soft and soothing, without an attention-grabbing melody or repetitive elements to distract you. And once he had music like that, how would he keep it interesting? By making that music change, without any abrupt sounds or cutoffs, depending on where you are. This is where we get a unique adaptive system, which dictates both how the music is implemented and how it gets composed in the first place. Simon explains it way better than I could, so I'm going to quote from his message to me here. Quote, Variation in the music is created by making different music loops, 20 to 80 seconds long, for each area, and crossfade between them as the player moves from one area to the next, emphasizing the player's experience of the change of setting. The sounds in the music often correspond to the location. For example, there are sounds that resemble metal rods being struck as they're suspended in water, which is heard when you're around the docks. If you're in a cave, the music often has a darker tone and a cave-like reverb, in the forest, the music is made up of wooden percussion. It's all synths, though. The music in the intro and outro has these bright, tingling percussion that is meant to be the audio equivalent of twinkling stars. You get the idea. Congas go in the jungle, flutes go in the desert, the rules of all media composers. The music implementation is made with very primitive, bare-bones methods. There's no music system counting the beat, so it's not possible to trigger stingers or transitions on the next downbeat, etc. Therefore, the music loops just fade from one to the next without taking rhythm or tempo into consideration. To make it sound seamless, despite the tracks having different tempos and rhythms, the tracks all start with around 10 seconds where there are no rhythmic elements, only a pad or a soundscape, so that the music of the area you're moving away from, which can be in the middle of a riff or have something rhythmic playing, can fade away and it won't clash with the rhythms of the new music that's fading in. Then, after around 10 seconds, when the old music has faded out completely, the new music introduces its rhythmic elements, if it has any. So the arrangement of the music is dictated by the choice of implementation and the restrictions of the system. In order to make the music loops blend seamlessly from a musical key perspective, all tracks are arranged like simple melodies or chords revolving around a pedal note, C. As with rhythms, I, Simon, 
avoid any notes that identify any specific scale during the first 10 seconds, so that two music loops with different scales can always crossfade smoothly. After 10 seconds, every music loop can safely explore melodies in any scale, regardless of what music was played just seconds before. End quote. And that really is ingenious. How do you get any bit of music to flow right into the next? Have them all start on a pedal note of C, and spend just enough time there that your and the game's palette is cleansed of the previous musical material. It's a problem in music implementation that's solved simply through music composition. But that's not always the only musical system at work. I'll share a few examples that Simon shared with me where the music gets used in slightly different ways. One is a puzzle you come across in which another figure mimics your movements but flipped around, and together you have to step across a series of tiles while avoiding others. I won't indicate the solution, but I will say that the music here just holds the pedal note, C, so that stepping on each tile will play the next ascending note in the C major scale. That's a classic way to denote completing video game tasks in a sequence. Next up, there's a pretty large desert that leads to several points of interest, such as a water canal, a tree on a spiral hill, a little shed, and they're all spread across larger distances of just sand. The music loop here is still that simple pedal note, but the points of interest each make their own little rhythmic loop on top of that. And Simon recounted, those extra musical layers are just treated as sound effects that the locations themselves are emitting. That way you hear them louder as you approach, and they don't overlap each other because they're spread out far enough in the desert. That's an elegant solution, no complex adaptivity involved. Beyond the desert, we have one of my favorite parts of the game. There's an arena with this little sleeping duck character and three of its eggs. You have to put these eggs on pressure plates and then activate a fourth one, but the pressure plates are spread across the edges of this arena, and once you start carrying an egg, the duck will wake up and try to return it to its nest. It's not aggressive towards you, but it is quick enough to keep you from having all three eggs on pressure plates with enough time to get to the fourth one. When it retrieves all its eggs, it falls back asleep. Again, I won't say how you get past this task, but I will talk about the unique musical system here. This duck has a clear melody that plays as a waltz on a music box, like a lullaby, and then that same melody becomes much faster in 4-4 on a goofy little synth while it chases you and retrieves its eggs. As Simon puts it, the transition between the former and the latter is masked by the duck waking up. But when the duck goes back to sleep, the game needs to transition smoothly back from the chase version to the lullaby version. Since, as noted before, the music system isn't counting beats or tempo, Simon instead had the game just wait for the end of the chase music file itself, and at the very end add on a custom transition that is composed to slow the tempo, change the rhythm, and smoothly swap the instruments, masking the seam between versions. It's a challenging transition to pull off, and it doesn't always happen right when the duck falls back asleep, but it always seems to happen soon enough that it works out. And finally, there's the example of your crashed ship, which needs a few color and shape coded parts to be fully repaired. As you put each part in its proper place, a new layer of music gets added, and all that is under the hood is unmuting a track in the music when a ship part is placed down. Again, it's simple, but effective. Since you return to this spot several times throughout the game, this system lets you hear how your progress is going, in addition to seeing it. Little details like that pervade the whole soundscape, allowing it to stay fresh as you explore, and never detracting from the space you need to think over the game's puzzles. And underneath all that, there's something grounding about this pedal note system, having one note that anchors all the parts of this soundtrack together. It's almost as if the note C is the gravity, keeping you on this planet until your ship is repaired. In the outro of the game, as you retrieve all the ship parts, you might just hear Simon's composition escape from the pedal note and give us something more elaborate and emotionally conclusive. But I'm not going to spoil the ending. Instead, I'll give Pan Pan my recommendation. It's on Steam and Nintendo Switch. I'm not sponsored by Spellcraft or Might and Delight. I just really enjoyed the puzzles that it gave me. And as I noted earlier, there's a link to a mix down of the soundtrack in this video's description. As the soundtrack is already designed for puzzle solving, it's really nice to listen to while working. Thanks again to Simon Vicklund for his wonderful insight into his experience writing the sound and music. You can check out his website and his eclectic video game music career in the links in the description as well. I'd also like to thank my patrons on Patreon, who help make my videos a more sustainable process. 
If you'd like to support my work directly and get perks like your credit here, seeing videos early, a vote on what music I arrange, and more behind-the-scenes content, you can visit my Patreon link, also in this video's description. And with that, I'm Scruffy, and thank you very much for watching.